Our scripture today will be from two sources, Matthew chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, and 2 Timothy, verse 15 of chapter 2. We just finished the series in the book of Leviticus last Sunday, and one week is too short a time to begin a series. So I get to do something today that every pastor loves to do periodically, and that is ride his favorite hobby horse. So I warn you in advance what I'm going to do, all right? My subject today is balance. And I am going to take these two scriptures to illustrate this theme. The devil took the Lord uh, to Jerusalem, set him on the, stood him on the, had him stand on the highest point of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written. And then Satan quotes Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12. He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against stone. The Lord answers him, It is also written, and the Lord quotes from Deuteronomy 6.16, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. What's happening here? Obviously, scriptures are teaching two sides of a truth. One side is commit yourself to the Lord and he'll take care of you. The other side is, don't tempt the Lord your God. Satan takes one part of Scripture, one aspect of truth, and attempts to isolate it from all other truth. Attempts to break the Scripture, as though the Scripture are a yardstick, and he took it over his knee and broke it, and took one piece of it and said, this piece is the whole thing. And the Lord says, no, it's not the whole thing. The counterbalance is this. Thou shalt not put the Lord your God to the test. Almost all misguided emphasis and false doctrinal teaching in the body of Christ stems from this same misuse of Scripture which Satan does, taking one part, tearing it away from the fabric of the rest of Scripture, and saying this one verse or this one element is the whole, and it's not. It must be balanced. Paul illustrates this theme in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, when he tells Timothy, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not to be, need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. The King James has more closely to the original, rightly divides the word of truth. The verb that is employed means literally to cut rightly. And that verb was used to describe a father dividing food at a dinner table where he apportions off the roast different pieces, different sizes to various members of the family. The word to cut rightly could be used of a farmer planting a straight furrow. He cut the ground rightly. Or it could be used of a mason cutting and squaring a stone so that it fit correctly into the building. Paul says this is the way that approved teachers ought to cut the word of God, rightly dividing the word of truth. The approved teacher fits the building blocks of truth together so that no one piece of truth usurps another piece of truth and that the whole of truth is undergirded so that one piece, ill-fitting, doesn't knock the whole structure out of balance. It seems to me as I, and this is a sermon really for believers today and for the church, it's kind of a pastoral message, as I look over the landscape of the body of Christ today, see a number of areas where the tendency is to get out of balance. One of my friends has said to me, but there's more fun in being out of balance. It gets boring being in balance all the time. He, said, he was joking. He said, this church is boring because it's, it's balanced. He said, I like a little bit of excitement by being on the extreme periodically. But there are some extremes in the body of Christ today, and I just want to look at these. You're, you're aware of these, I'm sure. But we want to focus on them. One extreme is in respect to end times. And there are, there are two extremes, really, in respect to the doctrine of the end times. One extreme is the view that every Middle Eastern crisis is a signal that the, is the hook that Russia is going to come down and people live almost paranoid about the future. And uh, they they're, they're, they're just live traumatized because the, the Lord is coming at any moment and everything's faded and there's nothing more you can do. The end has come and there's nothing ahead. And the other view is uh, very nonchalant. Uh, every day continues as the last day and nothing will change and everything's ordinary and no crisis is ever going to take place. The scripture teaches to live within both dimensions of truth. On the one hand, the Lord teaches us to watch. He says, you do not know the hour at which the Son of Man will come or return, so watch. On the other hand, he tells us in the Gospel of Luke, occupy till I come. 
And the word occupy in the original language means, is literally the word pragmatic. It's do business as normal till I come. Some people who get locked into one end of the extreme that the Lord is coming at any moment begin to, and not, and not prepare to live as though, as though he might and yet he might not, people can get panicky about living. They might say, well, there's no use going to school if that was their calling, to go to school and prepare for something. I don't have time to go to school because the Lord's going to come. And I sure want to get married before the Lord returns, so hurry up and marry somebody so I won't miss out on that before the Lord returns. All kinds of things like that happen. Uh, I was visiting a, a, a lady in the hospital who doesn't, isn't a part of our church fellowship, but I was asked to call on her, and I did. And dear lady who's recently come to the Lord, elderly, uh, has, a, if the Lord doesn't intervene, a, 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 a terminal disease. And she was sharing with me, just vibrant in her faith, and uh, she said something to the effect, I just found out the other day that we're living in the end times. And I thought, you know, it was so cute, because obviously we are living in the end times. It was a new truth she discovered, but... I want to say, you know, unless the Lord intervenes, you know, you are living in the end time. There is, a, there is a sense in which existentially we all live in the end times all the time because we don't know when the end of time will come for us. So it's always right to be prepared and to watch, but it's wrong to get panicky. A uh, full-page ad recently in the L.A. Times, most of you saw it, you know, advertising, the Messiah is here, you know, get ready, he's about to be revealed. And, and it's interesting to watch. The people that tend to be on the panic side of the spectrum got all shook up at that ad. Somebody came to me and said, Pastor, what do you think of that ad? I said, it's, to me, it's, real, it's kind of humorous. I said, the Antichrist would never be so stupid you know, as, to, as to do anything like that. I said, what, what you have here is some Eastern guru who is going to milk the West out of all their money, but you probably don't have the Antichrist here. I could always be wrong. Somebody's going to be right something. But uh, out of balance, people, can become, on the one hand, complacent, the Lord isn't coming, or on the other hand, panicky, hurry up, because we, we don't have time. Uh, Jake Gustafson was sharing with me, he's an attorney and the deacon in our church, that a person recently came in uh, to have, a, to have a, a will made out, and in the course of the will, uh, Jake said, uh, and this was a woman with three children and a husband, uh, young children, uh, you know, you ought to have uh, an insurance policy, I see you don't have an insurance policy, you ought to have an insurance policy, and she said, oh, I, we don't believe in having insurance because the Lord's coming soon. Jake said, what are you doing then making out a will? <laughs> sort of inconsistent. Um, my mom always said she believed in insurance because her father was an ardent Christian and he died without insurance because he didn't believe in it. She said, after I worked to pay off his funeral bill, I believed in insurance. <laughs> balance on end times. Another area for balance, and this is a kind of a... You know, just a, a little area, but it's, a, it's an important area when we worship together. It's balance in respect to worship, especially music and worship. We know that the Lord calls us to worship Him in spirit and in truth. That's what's really important with the Lord. And the Lord can take a variety of forms of worship because the Lord, see, His presence straddles the globe. And, and in different cultures, people worship the Lord differently. He looks at the heart, not so much the form. And even again in, in, in the renewal that is happening in the church today and all the music that's employed here in the States to worship the Lord, there's a wide variety of expression we can worship the Lord in. Uh, Jesus said uh, in his teaching that every scribe trained for the kingdom of God is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. And I think that's appropriate in respect to music as well. We need to avoid the mentality that if a song is more than five years old or if it's out of a hymnal, it can't be spiritual. But we need to also avoid the mentality that says if it's been written within the last 50 years, it can't be any good. Somehow out of, out of the old and the new, we can put together praise and worship to God. Every time we get in the car, my kids, when they're home, uh, they're, of course, in Israel this summer, but they, they immediately you know, want to listen to KYMS. And uh, we turn on the radio to KYMS when I'm not listening to a Dodger game or something like that, but generally most KYMS shouldn't reveal my shortcomings. Uh, and now, the KYMS doesn't always play my kind of Christian music, okay? A lot of it is, some of it isn't. Uh, but I'm so glad that my kids are listening to KYMS rather than secular stations. And if, they're, that's, if that is a, a, a form of worship that they can tune in to the Lord, fantastic. And... Um, and yet, if they can also broaden their expansion so that they can worship the Lord in songs that are old as well as new, that's great, too. I think one of my happiest and proudest moments came a few months ago when George, as he made out his shopping list for his 13th birthday, he had about three or four things on it, and top of the list was uh, he wanted the, the complete album of the Messiah with full choir and orchestra. I said, it's my boy. 
you know? Good, good variety and balance in music. That's what we've appreciated so much about Noel and music here as we worship, is that there's, there's an ability to enjoy many forms of music. Another area of, uh, that I see a need for balance is in politics. Christians today are in politics as never before, and, and I think that that's a good trend. We are salt and we are light in the world. We must, at the same time, though, recognize that Jesus' kingdom is not the kingdom of this world. He tells Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world, and we can't really, while we want to be involved in the political process because that's our right as citizens and indeed even our duty under the Constitution to be involved in the political process, to vote, to run for office, to contribute, to speak out our minds. At the same time, we shouldn't make the mistake of thinking if we can only just get this candidate elected or this party elected, we're going to have the kingdom of God on earth. We found even just recently in Orange County, sadly, that some of the people that many, many Christians had in, invested heavily in can be a disappointment in their personal lives. The political kingdom is not to be confused with the kingdom of God. The pulpit is not a place for the lifting up of the name of candidates or political parties. That's a position each one of us as individuals can do. The church as a corporate body and the pulpit of the church is called upon to lift up the name of Jesus. And we have simply in this church welcomed people without separating them on the basis of the political party they belong to. We have actually believe that Republicans can be Christians and Democrats can be Christians and people in the splinter parties can be believers as well. Although I understand three Christians of different political persuasions were having an argument as to who was right and they were proving their case from the scripture. The person who was politically conservative quoted Ecclesiastes chapter 10 verse 2. The heart of the wise inclines to the right, <laughs> but the heart of the fool to the left. The person who was more on the liberal side of the political spectrum said, ah, but Isaiah 4.3 says, those who are left in Zion shall be called holy. <laughs> the centrist said, ah, but you're all both wrong. Deuteronomy 5.32 says, so be careful to do what the Lord has commanded you do not you are not to turn aside to the right or to the left. There it is, folks. Politics. When it's a moral issue, the church should be involved. When it's a political issue, we as individual Christians may be involved, not the church as a corporate body. Another area for balance is in the charismatic renewal. This church considers itself, obviously, part of the charismatic renewal. I love the word restoration movement. This is a church that is a restoration movement church. We believe that the Holy Spirit is restoring in these days to the church the same kinds of things that happened in the apostolic church. We want a person to be able to read Acts and read the history of the contemporary church and say the same spirit is at work in both. We we're seeking to restore that, and the Holy Spirit is restoring in these days what he began when the church was born. But there are extremes in the body of Christ on the charismatic renewal. Some stand at one extreme and deny all the gifts of the Spirit and say they belong to another age or they're of the devil or they're simply uh, of human instrumentality and, and others on the far end of the other spectrum will, will look down their noses at anybody that hasn't had a charismatic experience. I was in the office of a pastor that has written a book on the charismatics, a very anti-charismatic book, which most things are attributed either to the flesh or to Satan. And as I looked in his office floor, I, I was really intrigued because there by his desk, there was a little passageway between his desk and the wall, which he had to walk in and out of to get back and forth to where he's going. And, he, and, and someone had cooled his book jacket into a rug, on, a little throw rug on the floor. It was a beautiful, beautiful work, exact replica of his book jacket. And, uh, and it had the word charismatics in the book. And, and it struck me as odd, and I'm sure that the pastor didn't have this in mind, but in order to get back and forth from behind his desk every time he made a move, that particular pastor had to step on the charismatics. <laughs> this is kind of interesting, and, and there are some, some, some extremes, I suppose, like that in the body of Christ. And yet there, there on the other hand, are people who give an, an excessive attention to the gifts of the Spirit, almost uh, kind of detach their heads and, uh, and, um, and do really funny way out sorts of things. Uh, there is balance. When the gifts flow and they are properly taught and regulated, then there is great freedom and encouragement and edification for the body of Christ. We neither seek the gifts of the Spirit without the fruit, nor the fruit of the Spirit without the gifts. We seek both the personality of the Lord as reflected in the fruit and the power of the Lord as reflected in the gifts. 
Another key area where there, is very, there are various strains of teaching in the body of Christ is in the area of submission. I've always cherished the example of a group of people in the scripture called the Bereans, B-E-R-E-A-N-S, whose story is told in Acts chapter 17, verse 11. When given the doctrine of the gospel by the preaching of Paul, the scripture says that they are commended for examining the scripture to see whether these things were so. They didn't simply accept things because an authority figure told them it was true. They accepted things because what the authority figure told them squared up with the scripture. Some of the extremes in the submission movement, on the one hand, you have people who say that God has a pecking order, and if you are to know the mind of God, you must somehow know your place in the chain of command because you don't get directions except you are in that very rigid chain of command. There are others who, as a, as a, a kind of a swing against that, so emphasize the independence of the believer that there's really no room for submission or cooperation or interdependence with the believer because everybody's free to do their own things. As is often the case, truth in the scripture works both sides and stands in the middle between the two. In regard to the chain of command thing, we fail to realize historically, I think we sometimes fail to realize this, that the kind of chain of command thinking led to the church in the dark ages. The idea that God doesn't communicate to the little people, he only communicates to the big people on top and everybody gets their orders on down through the group. One uh, organization, which I won't name, it will be familiar to everyone in this group, a missions organization, is into the submission uh, teaching. And uh, they, uh, one couple who was from our church that went to be with that organization ultimately left it because as they were in service in a particular aspect of that mission, they discovered a number of things which really didn't seem to square with the scripture. They went and talked to the leaders about it and suggested some changes be made, and the response of the leadership was to be quiet that that's not your role to suggest to leaders what they should do. That when God got ready to change the situation, he would speak to the leaders, and then the leaders would have a message and they'd tell everyone else. Well, granted, sometimes the Lord in a situation asks us to be quiet, but the extreme of that is the, the whole Nazi mentality, if you'll excuse the application, but the problem with, with Nazism was that everybody blamed somebody else for their lack of responsibility by saying, I simply followed orders. And one of the things that the Lord teaches us in the scripture is we are responsible. We are a priest or priest us unto God and we bear responsibility for our own actions and God never turned the regency of our life over to someone else. If you must twist a person's arm to get them to submit, if you must exploit them or manipulate them by dumping guilt upon them, then you're really not walking in the example of Christ who gained submission from others because they were secure in his love. He didn't have to twist arms, he didn't have to manipulate. He didn't have to batter people psychologically to get them to submit. He didn't have to put them into repression and depression. He loved them, and when you are loved and you know you're loved, you are gladly follow a leader. Jesus proved himself a servant. There are some areas, and even in our own marriage, where Jewel is more knowledgeable about things than I am, and it would be stupid at that point if I said, submit to me when she actually is more aware of some things than I am, especially in the field of personal business, which I goofed up a few times. If I'd let her turn her loose, we'd be, you know, living in the Riviera today. But anyway, I need to, she, in some areas, just a sad, just kidding. But uh, she has better judgment than I. And Jesus, I think, really puts his finger on the balance of submission when he tells his disciples in Matthew 20, verses 25 through 27, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must first be your servant. And whoever wants to be slave must be, your, must be first, must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. There is a delicate balance between authority and authoritarian. And when we have authority, the Lord wants us to exercise authority, but not to do it in an authoritarian manner. Does that make sense? When we lead, there's a difference between leading and domineering. Some people, when they hear the word lead, think it means domineer. And lead is frequently a matter of pointing the way with our own example, or even more so often than with our words. I don't believe that there is any such thing as the independent Christian or the independent church. There is no such thing as independence in the body of Christ. There is interdependence. We are vitally connected to one another. There is a place for proper submission and respect for properly biblically constituted authority, but it can never be 
done in a way that manipulates people, dumps guilt upon them, or freezes the God-given potential that is in that person. And I see some forms of submission, as they are taught in the body of Christ today, that actually bring people into tremendous bondage. And for them to come out, it's almost like working their way out of a cult. Our daughter has recently had a major decision to make. And I, after a lot of thinking back and forth and praying about that decision, I gave to her my reasons of what I recommended that she do. And then I said to her, Evangeline, you are growing up. There are some areas where you're old enough now to make up your own mind. I'm not going to make your decisions the rest of your life. If I've trained you right, then you ought to be able on your own as a priestess before God to make your own decisions. And they'll be right decisions. You need that responsibility. So here's how I feel on this matter. You seriously consider what I tell you. Then you pray about it. And then you make the decision because I, feel, I can feel good about the other alternative and I'll be with you no matter what you decide. I think that's a good, healthy balance to teach young people responsibility and not to expect that my daughter, when she's still 40 years of age, if she's unmarried, is going to be calling me up, asking me what to do next. Hopefully, I can raise her to be an interdependent person rather than a person who is without the ability to make important decisions. And I really feel that when the Lord says, if the Son of Man sets you free, you'll be free indeed. That's the kind of thing he's talking about, the development of our God-given power to have dominion in the earth. Another area of tension, uh, some within the body of Christ, where I think there's a need for balance, is in the whole area of prosperity and healing. I agree with the prosperity teaching people that some people are not prosperous and are not healed because they are negative thinkers. If there's any blessing that the prosperity teaching people will have brought is that there are some people who would always, when you ask them how they were, would give you a whole string of things that just make you feel miserable that you ever ask them how they were. Now all those arguments have been kind of stripped out of the medicine closet and, and they have to force up to the fact that often they feel lousy because they're such negative thinkers and they brought sickness upon themselves because they're so anxious. And the reason why everybody can't stand them is because they just think negatively all the time. So that's been a blessing. But it seems to me that faith is like a coin that has two sides. One side of the coin says now and the other side of the coin says then and some aspects of faith are such that in their operation the effects are immediate change immediately takes place miracles happen healings happen and yet the scripture teach us teaches us that there are sometimes sufferings which call for perseverance and that's the side of faith that's called then the faith has both an immediate aspect and a persevering aspect and we need to walk both lines in the scripture staying sensitive to the what the holy spirit may say to us in a particular situation because often the red or the green light is the direct result of a relationship with the Holy Spirit and you can quote scripture on both sides of the fence and wind up, you know, with the parameters, but it takes the immediate operation of the Spirit to tell you what it is the then or the now side of the coin. I have been deeply concerned on the part of some in the faith confession movement over the lack of mercy and compassion that is at times evidence. To develop faith does not mean you have to forsake compassion. A lady who attends our church called the office, talked to one of the pastors recently for prayer for a, her daughter who was away in another area in a hospital. And she called the particular church in that hospital's area and asked them to, if they wouldn't mind having an elder or someone from the church come and pray for this little girl. And the church inquired as to whether or not the girl had been prayed for before. I said, yes, the girl has been prayed for and anointed with oil. Whereupon the person at the, at, on the other end of the line said, well, then we will not send anyone to pray uh, for her because she's already been prayed for, and if she hasn't been healed, then something is standing in the way, and it's probably you. You don't have enough faith for your daughter's healing, and we're not going to send somebody out there to pray for her. You get your faith in order, and the Lord will heal her. Well, now, I, I could admit, that you, you almost forced it out of me, I could admit theologically, perhaps, to the possibility that maybe a lack of faith, you know, there's plenty of, there's evidence for that in Scripture, that sometimes a lack of faith can indeed make a healing not happen. But even if that's the case, the Lord never gives us uh, the right to tramp on a person, to exercise no compassion. Now, I suspect in this case that, that wasn't true at all, that it wasn't a matter of faith, it was something else, maybe a mystery that I don't understand. But the Lord, we must remember, was a man that could be moved and was moved with compassion, and he was a man of tears. And somehow, we need to keep that in focus. You remember several years ago, the Parker family in Barstow, California, had a 10-year-old diabetic boy and they had a gift of faith that God was going to heal him and they removed insulin from him. 
made the front page headlines. He died. And the Parkers were ultimately sentenced by a court for, uh, I think it was a form of manslaughter. They served a prison term. They were members of the Assemblies of God Church in Barstow, California. They've now written a book called We Let Our Son Die, published by Harvest House. It's one of the most moving books I've ever read. But this, this dear, this, these dear parents come to wrestle with the guilt that they feel for having let that happen to their son. And they said, we had all the faith in the world. We didn't lack faith. We rebuked doubt, and we confessed healing. There was not an iota of doubt anywhere. In looking back, we realized that what we did wrong is that we elevated the law of faith higher than the law of love. And love motivated us to want to care for our son. When faith was not working, we wanted to give our son insulin, but we substituted faith for love. And we realized that faith does not work in opposition to love, nor does love work in opposition to faith, but love and faith must work together. And love endures, love lasts, and it's a higher priority than even faith. I thought, wow, that puts it about as good as I think anyone could put it. From the travail of their own experience, they see and understand this truth. We need to cry out on the one hand, Lord, increase our faith. We need to be more believing people. We simply can't sit back and say, well, whatever's going to happen will happen. I'm not for that. The scripture exhorts us to faith, and exhorts us to believe in the Lord's intervention in situations, and exhorts us to believe him for the miraculous. At the same time, God calls us to be balanced and to not question people's motives nor condemn them with the accusation, there's sin in your life, that's why you're going through this but rather to recognize there is a mysterious aspect of God as well where we don't know what he's doing, but we know that during that time he's producing something very important in our life, character formation and perseverance. Faith is sometimes a rough thing to get a hold of. I was reading in the newspaper this week, uh, Wednesday, July 21, L.A. Times, a uh, story on Mother Angelica. Do I have her name pronounced right? Is it Angelica or Angelica? A uh, delightful story. This is the woman, uh, charismatic Catholic, who has founded the... Uh, uh, Eternal Word Television Network, which is on cable TV all across the United States. Tremendous woman of faith. She says uh, in here that uh, says, uh, the guy in the living room is convinced that nothing can be done about anything, but every time everybody knows that 12 nuns couldn't pull off this, that is, founding this TV network, but the fact that these nuns succeeded says to the poor guy in the living room, hey, you can do it too, try it. And she has that kind of a real joyous, ebullient spirit. The, the end of the article in the LA Times is what I wanted to focus on. She talks about faith, because here's a woman whom God has used to literally bring a network into existence that has cost millions of dollars, and, and her story of doing this is just an incredible series of steps of faith and the leading of the Holy Spirit. She, she tackles the question, what faith means. And she said, you know what faith is to me? It's one foot on the ground and one foot in the air and that queasy feeling in your stomach. <laughs> Somebody said to me the other day, Mother, you're a woman of great faith. And I said, no, I'm not a woman of great faith. I'm just a coward that keeps moving. <laughs> like that. One other area, just briefly, that we need balance is in the area of holiness. I grew up in a church atmosphere where there was a high dosage of legalism. A lot of things were wrong and very few things were right. I'm eternally grateful to my dad that he had the courage to buck that. And in the days when nobody had TVs and it was preached against, Dad got a TV, even though he was a preacher and took criticism for it. And when other people preached against ball games, he had the good sense to take his boys to a ball game. So I, I you know, I, my hat's off to that. I see, though, among persons who have been Christians for a while and who have gotten free of some of the wrong aspects of legalism, that there is a swing to the other side of legalism, which is license. And God help us to be neither legalists nor people who are licensed to have to just do anything without accountability. There are a lot of things that can be done spiritually that are very harmful for, to, to us. And even though we are, so to speak, free, uh, freedom does not mean the freedom to do that which is wrong or to fill our minds with that which is evil. When the reformer, the Catholic uh, Dominican reformer, Savonarola, and the uh, end of the 15th century, told Florence, Italy, be free. They applauded him, and they were glad to be free. But when he said to Florence, be holy, be pure, it took his life. Somehow we need to hear both words, be free, but be holy, be pure. We never understand forgiveness if we use forgiveness as a license to sin. Forgiveness can become too cheap a word. It needs to be a sacred word, not a license to sin 
but a relief from sin. Well, in conclusion, I think this whole message on balance is saying to us, if I could put it in the form of an analogy, a river, the picture of a flowing river, a river to be a good river, to be energetic, to produce the things that a river needs to produce, requires two banks. It requires two sides, two shores. If you have a river with only one bank, the water is going to run freely all over the plain. It's going to flood everybody out. And biblical teaching is like that. The Holy Spirit is the river that, that flows between the banks of scriptural teaching. And on, on often on any given matter, you can find in scripture uh, elements that go on a continuum uh, in respect to faith or prosperity, submission or the like. Uh, you can frequently pull out scriptures that would seem to support differing emphasis, but what the scripture calls us to do is to recognize that these are the banks of truth. And truth flows in between these. And the application of truth comes as we're sensitive to what aspect of the word that the Holy Spirit is at that moment applying and putting into focus in our life. And stay within the banks. And don't act as if there's only one bank and the other bank isn't there. That's how you get into heresy and false emphasis and bondage in your life. But live within the banks. And the Holy Spirit works within it. We discover freedom by staying within the banks. Let's unite our hearts in prayer. Lord, in the development of our Christian life, we pray for maturity, that we might grow up into the full stature of the person of Christ Jesus, our Lord. We realize, Lord, that that part of growth involves many times trial and error on our part, mistakes that we make, imbalances we get into, but your spirit is faithful and always drawing us back to that center in you. Lord, there are probably some areas that we ought not to have balance on, that we're to be zealots on. Certainly, love and loyalty to you is an area where you call us to have a white-hot zeal. Now, there are other areas, Lord, in the development of our Christian life and in doctrine where we can cause ser serious injury to ourselves and to others by only paying attention to what part of your word may say on a subject and not understanding your principle of quoting the whole scripture in your statement, the scriptures cannot be broken. Help us, Lord, not to treat the scriptures as something which can be broken, that we have the right to reach in our hand and grab a piece of the fabric and tear it away from the whole. But your word is a living word, and it's meant to be taken in its totality continually. Help us to be balanced without being blasé. Help us to be balanced without having the fire of devotion to you go dim. Help us to be balanced without being prideful. Oh, isn't it wonderful we're balanced? Help us to be balanced with humility, with a servant's heart. Let us discover, Lord, your freedom. Thank you for your love for us, for your constant concern, for your desire to bring up children who as adults magnify and glorify your name. Bless this people, we pray, through Christ.